Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Johnny Fox, the coordinator of education and National History Day at the Indiana Historical Society. Um, and I have Allison Singleton with me today. She is the librarian at the Genealogy Center at Allen County Public Library, which is located in Fort Wayne. And today we are going to discuss how to conduct digital research. Um, I'm this is primarily going to be Allison um, talking about how to uh, do great research on the internet and how to utilize primary and secondary sources. And we're, we'll both be discussing um, our institutions and how you can utilize our digital collections as well as some other um, online resources that we enjoy. So I will hand it over to Allison. She said, Allison, um, first things first, at the end, contact information is available, and I'm sure Johnny agrees. Please contact if you have questions. Um, I really want to help. I want everybody to be successful. I want every student to be successful. Um, I think National History Day is a fantastic uh, competition, and the projects are great, and I absolutely love the whole hands-on learning progress. So. Um, just wanted to make sure you guys knew that. And also, please feel free to ask questions um, throughout the presentation. This is kind of weird, so the questions will be along the side, and we'll try and catch them as we can. So, um, very excited to have you. So, let's go ahead and... Okay, I need to move that. There we go. Let's go ahead and talk about and moving this. There we go. The importance of research to National History Day. Um, so it's what moves those projects further in the contest and it builds the student's ability to differentiate between those primary and secondary sources, create a strong thesis statement, create annotated bibliographies, and retain information to speak about their topics to judges and learn to improve upon their research skills for future projects. Uh, what was interesting today is I was actually out at a high school working with mainly sophomores and talking to them about getting their projects started. And it was fascinating to ask them questions and see what they already knew about how these projects work, because this is the very first time the school has ever done these. And they were able to answer some questions with flying colors, like primary and secondary sources, beautifully done. Uh, thesis statement, they knew what that was. Annotated bibliographies, no clue. What is that? So I had to actually show them annotated bibliographies and explain that, hey, there's resources available. We want you to be able to get this. Um, and then they also, for some reason, and I think a lot of students have this misconception, were thinking that it was a, more of a presentation to judges instead of being a interview where you are asked questions from the judges. So it was kind of interesting to see what their perspectives were, um, especially coming into this webinar tonight. So um, I really think this is kind of fun topic to approach right after that. So with these primary and secondary sources, these students were really good about knowing the difference. Um, there was another school that actually had a little bit more problems when I was asking them what the differences were. Um, so the primary sources are very important. Um, one of the things that judges look for is um, being balanced between those primary and secondary sources. So they want to make sure that the students understand and the judges also take into account okay some primary sources some topics are going to be in different languages or they're going to be harder to find the further back in history it is maybe there aren't a lot of primary sources and this is a topic that is heavy on secondary sources um, but the judges are going to be looking for the student to understand why that is when they're talking to them. So history is kind of unique and different with trying to find primary sources for an event that happened in 
the 13th century versus an event that happened in the 19th century. Um, so kind of making sure the students understand that um, and explaining it to students is kind of fun. Um, anytime I have to do it, I use hands. Um, so primary is the first hand. It's the hand that touches the event. Secondary is the second hand. So then what I do is actually pick something up and say, okay, this is the event. I am holding it. This is first hand. And then that I take that object, document, whatever I'm holding, random thing to explain. I hand it to another person and I say, it's already happened. It's 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 years later. You are now writing about it. You are now the second hand. So sometimes kids like visuals. I'm a visual person, so I tend to um, instruct that way and tell people how to do things that way, especially with students. But it it varies. It really varies. It varies on teaching style. It varies on what you are comfortable with. So I enjoy that, but who knows what will work. Um, so actually, I'm going to turn it back over because we're going to talk about Indiana Historical Society. OK, um, so we have uh, a multitude of sources at the at the Historical Society, a lot of good online resources. Um, and those are things that are geared toward educators and students that we have through the education department. Um, and then we also have um, a lot of our library and archival collections online. So I'm going to go to our website. And it can be a little tricky to uh, to navigate, um, but we'll start with um, some of our education resources. So if you go to this learn section on our web page, go to it, you could go to educator resources or student resources, but we'll just start with education for now. Um, so we have let's see here. We'll go to educator resources down here. And let's see. So we have, let's see, I'm going to go to curriculum first. So that is how you get to Hoosiers in the American Story, which is the first one I want to talk about. So this was a book. Um, that IHS published. It's a great textbook. We have a lot of educators who already have it in their classrooms. Um, but if you don't have a copy of it or you're not an educator and you want to use this for your kid or you don't happen to have it in the classroom, we have um, PDFs available online for free. So you can just go to each chapter there and you can download that for your classroom or for research purposes. So that's a great resource that we have. Um, another one is Destination Indiana. And I'm going to have to, let's see. I believe that is under student resources. So let's go there. And so. Yeah, so that's right here, Destination Indiana, and that'll take you to a different web page. So you'll just click OK. And this is something that you can utilize in our building or online. Um, this is great. So we have different journeys, and they can be broken up by theme, um, whether that be, you know, different people, um, different organizations, different issues. Uh, one of my favorite things is that we have a journey on every county in Indiana. So if you have kids who are doing local history, this is a great place to start. Um, so we'll just go to the Monroe County one for an example. So there might be separate journeys within that county. There's also going to be just a general journey on that county. And so these journeys utilize coll our collections here at Indian Historical Society. So they'll be based out of images that we have in our collection. 
Um, and then there will be information that goes with it. There's a narration, but you don't have to use that. So I think that that's a great starting point um, if they're doing local history. Also, let's see, to get to, and I, I encourage you all to just kind of explore um, the educator and the student resource pages, um, just because there is a lot to offer. Um, and it, it just, it's worth just playing around with since I'm not going to touch on everything tonight. Um, but we'll go ahead and jump to our library and archives. So that's just this next section over here. If you go to research, and then if you scroll down to this link down here, our collections. So this gets broken up into two different components kind of so we have if you see at the top here see our digital collections so this is if you search through digital collections you're only going to look at resources that our library and archives have scanned and put online um, so let's say I want to look up things that we might have online on the circus in Indiana. And so I just type that into the search engine. And so this is going to show me anything that's been scanned. Under digital collections, it's going to be predominantly images. Um, but there will be some manuscript materials. So if we have anything that was in an IHS publication or any sort of journal, anything like that, that might be scanned and up here. But um, as you see, it's just it's a lot of a lot of images. But those are you know great primary sources to work with. Um, if you want to look at things that are might be online as well as things that are not online then you can go down to search the library catalog and so this is going to give you a general overview of what we have in our collection in-house and online so we'll do the same thing and type in circus into this search engine here and so here is where you can break down um, how to search so if let's see there is a um, downloadable options. So this is probably going to be digital stuff like what you might find in that digital collection. I'm going to click on archival material because that is going to show us what we have at the Indiana Historical Society because since um, this is WorldCat, it will show you what other libraries and institutions might have, but we're going to go to archival material. So this is stuff that we physically have in our library. Um, so let's see, we'll go to this. So this is John Hanner's Circus Research Collection. Um, and so on here, you can look at information on the collection. Um, so even if you, you know, you do have kids who do want to come in and do research it's nice to be able to look at these collection guides beforehand and so that'll give you a brief overview of the collection there might even be some good research material in this sketch in the beginning of the collection guide um, that can give you a good brief overview of um, maybe you're researching this specific person and so that can give you some information on them um, but again just the main difference between these two links is that when you go to search the library catalog you're going to look at things that we have online and in the building if you're looking for just digital stuff things that you can access and look at without even coming to the historical society you'll just go on ahead and go to see our digital collections um, and so that is all I have for that. So I'm going to give this back to Allison. Um, awesome, thank you. So one of the things that I like to make sure that teachers and students are aware of is that the Genealogy Center at the Allen County Public Library is the largest public genealogy library in the United States. We have materials from 
all over the United States. Our focus on, is on North America, and we do have the largest collection of Canadian records outside of Canada. We also have the largest collection of South African materials out of South Africa, which is completely random and different. Um, but with these materials, genealogists are not just looking for their families. They're looking to put their families in historical context. Um, they want more than just the names and dates. They want the stories behind those people. So these are the everyday people. So it's kind of the everyday person history project. Um, so that's what walks into our library every day. And because we have such a large collection, we have people that come in from all over the world to do research. My favorite is the fact that Canadians come down to do research because we do have such a large collection. You wouldn't think that, but they do. Um, so a couple things that we have on site that are really unique. Uh, we have 17 on-site databases. Now these are databases that are, are only available while people are at the genealogy center or any of the branches. If you are not, or your students are not able to physically come here to use these databases, one of the things you can do is reach out to us and we can help you find another option. Um, because there are libraries that do have these databases, it's hit or miss to where they are and whether or not you'd be able to get some of that information. But we'll do our best. And we also want to make sure that students are successful. So if there's a student that is contacting us for information, a lot of times we will go a little bit above and beyond. Um, and that is true of most librarians. Um, we have a soft spot in our heart for uh, students, anybody that's younger, because I'll be honest, most of the people that come in and do genealogy are retirees, female over 50 usually over 60 to be honest so anytime we get anybody younger in it's like a happy dance we're just happy to be working with somebody different um so we have seven librarians that are full-time and all of us have a focus and a passion for genealogy family history and history in general um, so it's kind of interesting to look at what our different focuses are so for example one of my colleagues is an expert on Fort Wayne, Allen County, Indiana history. So if we get a question like that, it goes immediately to him. Um, one of my colleagues is pretty much a Civil War expert. And so anytime we get a question on the Civil War or sometimes even the South, uh, it goes to her. So we all have kind of a focus, but we understand research and we know how to find things pretty quickly and kind of scarily for some people. I know that's not quite a word, but it terrifies people how quickly I can find information on them. Um, so we have 1.2, actually over 1.2 now, um, million physical items in our collection. And we also have two Lincoln librarians. Now they're not in the genealogy center per se, but they're part of special collections, which is the overarching over the genealogy center and the Lincoln library. So what you may not know is that there was a Lincoln Museum in Fort Wayne and in 2009, I want to say, yeah, 2009, um, the Lincoln Financial Group decided, hey, why are we still running a museum? This doesn't make sense. So they decided that they wanted to get rid of it. Fine. So a consortium was put together in Indiana to keep it in Indiana. So the 3D physical objects, and they did win, by the way, against Springfield and everywhere else. So yay, Indiana. Um, the 3D physical objects went to the State Museum. The 2D objects, meaning photographs, papers, uh, books, all of those stayed in Fort Wayne and came to the Allen County Public Library. So we have two librarians whose entire focus is to study and be curators of this collection. Um, so if anybody has a specific Lincoln question about the family, about um, anything to do with Lincoln, and sometimes even the Civil War, depending on the topic, 
these librarians are a fantastic resource. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this and show you guys the Genealogy Center website. Um, to begin with. So we have a different website than the Allen County Public Library um, because we have such a lot of information. We have more information than that could live on one site. So what we have is databases and on site. That's what we're going to cover right now. Now these are the things that you physically have to be here for. Now there's ancestry. There's things like find my past and my heritage. If you've ever done genealogy, you may have heard of these. Um, find my past is uh, has a specialization in England. Um, it's based in London, so they have a lot more records for British and Irish. Um, they have church registers. They have military records. Um, they're one of the few places that have Catholic records, even for America. Um, there's a weird thing about a lot of the Catholic dioceses don't want to give up their information. So this is one of the companies that have been able to get it. Um, my heritage is based in Israel. So they have a lot of Eastern European information that is hard to get a hold of. So kind of good to know. Um, fold three right here. This is actually a military website. Um, so this is owned by Ancestry. And we'll come back to that. There's also Newspaper Archive and Newspapers.com. We also have the new Sentinel Text Archive, which is only applicable here, so I doubt that's going to be too helpful. And America's Genealogy Bank. America's Genealogy Bank is special because of their current obituaries, which are hard to get a hold of because of copyright, but they do have a historical newspaper section historical books collection, and historical documents collection. Now, if somebody's doing something on American government records, America's Genealogy Bank actually might be pretty helpful. Um, for a lot of my examples, whenever I do a class on Genealogy Bank, I actually search Alexander Hamilton, A, because I might be obsessed with musical, and B, because he's such a great example, because he wrote so much. Um, and a lot's been written about him, too. If somebody is looking for New England, the American ancestors is a lot of times very helpful. Now, a lot of you may be thinking, why, are, why is she telling us about these very specific genealogy sites? I don't care. Here's the thing. Genealogy and history go hand in hand. So yeah, these have a lot of documents that have names and dates, which is the basis for genealogy research. But the beautiful part is, is there's also history in here. So you can find information about um, maybe life during a certain time period. Maybe somebody is looking for background information on a family. Um, it, it really depends. The other thing you may know is we have a lot of newspapers and a lot of them are very specialized. Um, African-American newspapers. There's also American Indian newspapers. So these are pretty special in the fact that you can't always get a hold of these. Um, so if somebody has a topic that could be beneficial with these, you're going to want to look at them. Now, the thing I'm going to go back to is newspapers.com, fold three, and Ancestry. Okay. Ancestry has a grant. And you can get Ancestry Fold3 and Newspapers.com in your classroom for free. If you're not aware of this yet, you are now. Um, it's a pretty easy application. And it's pretty easy to keep renewing it. And this these are great resources for any type of historical project. So Ancestry, yeah, there's census records, um, but you also can find other really cool records in there as well, including some newspapers, which is kind of interesting, but passenger lists and, you know, histories of different locations. Fold 3, you have access to U.S. military records. Um, so Fold 3 is going to be more helpful 
for people that are researching um, pre-20th century military. So honestly, post-20th century military is a little bit more difficult um, just in general. So your World War I, World War II, you can get some great projects out, um, but they need to be careful because sometimes those records are not available. Um, it's still too recent for a lot to have been written. And it's kind of recent for um, families to start giving up these records and having them digitized. So it's we're in this weird limbo place trying to gather information that's post 20th century. Um, if it's an overarching thing like a battle um, or something like that, you're going to be able to find more information. Um, if it's going into specifics that include people, that's going to be harder because there was a fire at the National Archives in St. Louis and the personnel records were destroyed for 80% of the Army and 70-ish percent of the Air Force. So just keep that in mind. Newspapers.com is fantastic, and I highly recommend it. If you get Ancestry K-12 in your classroom for no other reason, get newspapers.com. Um, that will help with projects because for our purposes, they're primary sources from the time period. So this could really push a project further. So I wanted to make sure that you were aware that you can access those. Now, if you're here on site, our ancestry is different than the ancestry you have access to from your local library. Um, ours is Ancestry Institution, which means we have access to the world records. So if we have somebody that's looking for something very specific um, in another country, we can help them out with that. So you can kind of see there's a little bit, there's maps, there's atlases. If you've never looked at this before, there's government records, criminal um, directories. Yearbooks are a really big thing right now. Uh, citizenship and naturalization records. So you can find lots of really interesting pieces in this record set. And just so you can see what Fold3 and newspapers.com look like, I'm going to click on them just for our own amusement. So this is what Fold 3 looks like. You can do a search. Now there's memorials made for people who have died. And a lot of times, so for this person, just because it's a featured memorial, somebody, uh, probably a family member, has gone through and added all of this information. They put in, um, information about the person, photographs, because they wanted to be able to remember this person. Now, for a lot of people, these just have a name, and that's pretty much it. So it gets a little bit more frustrating for people, but the memorials do exist if somebody wants to go through it. Um, and you can go by war or conflict to see what kind of records are available. And then newspapers.com, just because it'll pull up where it, you can search it kind of like you can search Amazon or Google. Um, and I found that working with students that this is probably one of the easiest newspaper websites to go through with them because you can put in a keyword or a name um, and it does say that it goes to current, but keep in mind that most newspapers are under copyright from around 1924 to current day. So if somebody is looking for something very specific from a location, they may not be able to find it without contacting a local library and having it pulled off of microfilm or microfiche, um, which sounds terrifying, but again, librarians want to help. So make sure students understand that there are limitations to finding newspapers because of copyright. And if they're looking for newspapers in other countries, there are possibilities as well. Um, if you go to browse through here, 
it actually tells you what other countries they have here. So it might be helpful for some students to get a few extra primary sources. Um, the other thing is the Lincoln Collection. Now the Lincoln Collection I have on site um, because we have such a beautiful collection here in the building. Now, the, the other part of it is that most of it has been digitized. So people can access this online through the collection. And there's also things that are written about Lincoln through the Lincoln Lore um, publication. And so if you have a student that's still kind of in limbo, um, it might be helpful for them to maybe look through this if they have any interest whatsoever, because they might be able to come up with some more inspiration. And if I go up here to discover, it takes you to the ACPL version of this. And you can go through and say, okay, I want to look at images, um, view all images. So we actually have the family collection. Um, my favorite picture and everybody else's favorite is usually the spirit photograph where it's Mary Todd Lincoln sitting there and Lincoln's spirit is supposedly over her shoulder um, done by Mumbler who was very famous for doing spirit photography. So maybe if somebody sees this, they may think, oh, I can actually do a project on Mumbler and his spirit photography instead of Lincoln. So you never know where people are going to get their inspiration. Um, but this collection is available and there's a ton of information. And if I go back, you can also see that there's books, documents, um, there's so much in this collection. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of materials. So please make sure that your students know it exists because it's such a rich collection and they really do like working with students. So let's move on to offsite research. By the way, this is that Mumbler photograph. If you can see Lincoln kind of hanging out there over her shoulder, I find it fun. Um, so offsite. We have over 3.2 million digital assets. We have two digital partners that are actively digitizing our books. We also still have those seven librarians. We answer emails and phone calls every day. We're open. And we're open seven days a week. So <laughs> we can help. Um, the two Lincoln librarians, they are available to help via email, via phone, whatever they need to do. And the thing is, is all of us are on social media through the Genealogy Center and the Lincoln Library. So if a student is more comfortable sending us a message through like, I don't know, Facebook or Instagram, they can, we'll answer. So just, it kind of depends on what the student's comfortable with, but we'll still help. <laughs> So let's go back to the Genealogy Center website so I can show you some of the free databases. Now, a few things that we have here. Ignore our catalog and the Microtext catalog. What you want to look at are the rest of the things. So we have the African American Gateway. Now, these are materials that are specific to states. For example, if I click on Indiana, the very first thing that comes up are websites. These are all websites that have to do with Indiana and African Americans. So if somebody has a topic, this might be the first place they want to look. And then if you go down to Allen County, Indiana resources, we have a partnership with the local genealogy society that has benefited us greatly because what they have been doing is digitizing stuff for us so we can put it in our digital collection. Now, this information may or may not be helpful for students that are elsewhere or have other interests, but I wanted to make sure you were aware that there are some things in here um, that have been digitized that could be 
helpful for a student that's looking maybe for, I don't know, there's a general electric collection. So there's an entire collection on the company, General Electric. There was a factory in Fort Wayne, but this information could be applicable across the board for the company as a whole. So while it's in the Allen County, Fort Wayne, Indiana resources, it's still something that could be applied elsewhere. So wanted to make sure that you guys knew that that was available. Um, the other thing to look at with this, as I X out of things, um, there's also other com companies available. And then the one thing that I think is interesting is we have the Zollner Pistons. Um, so it's, so we have sports teams in, that are specific to Fort Wayne. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to get a hold of records. So if you have a student um, that is just super interested in sports and they can't find a topic, this may be something to suggest just for the simple fact that it's available online. Um, what's not available online right now, but all you have to do is contact us, is we actually have um, a volunteer who comes in very regularly and has one of the largest collections for the Fort Wayne Daisies. Now, for those of you that are familiar with the movie A League of Their Own, um, it's based off of the Fort Wayne Daisies and the person who um, Dottie Henson was basically, well, there's a Dottie. Dottie played for the Fort Wayne Daisies and the movie character was based off of her. So all of that information lives here. And that could be a really cool project. And there's somebody that we would be willing to get the student in contact with for um, interviews. So while this looks very specific to Fort Wayne, Allen County, there's still information in there that could be beneficial outside. As to family Bible records and family resources, probably not helpful. The Genealogy Center surname file, so not helpful. Indiana resources might be helpful, mainly for the fact that there's some kind of random general resources and statewide resources. Um, a lot of them are courthouses or universities. By county, it's typically cemeteries, so don't even have them bother. But the cool collection that is in here, because we have nowhere else to put it digitally, is that collection for South Africa. So if you're familiar with what's going on in South Africa, um, some records are being destroyed. We'll just go with that. So we have a donor who lives in South Africa and makes trips here with documents. So this information keeps popping into our collection and we digitize it as we can. So like this person, we actually have newspaper extracts from these different time periods. So we're able to talk about the different events that was happening in South Africa for the settlers. So if somebody is looking for a project, that could be kind of interesting and different. So you could be looking at the historical side of it, but still have an eye to what's going on currently in the country. So kind of a different way to look. Um, we also have the Native American Gateway. So this focuses in on Native American research. Now, everything on the left side of this website is not really going to be helpful because they're physical books. It's the right side that's going to be helpful, um, including websites on furthering research for Native Americans. The next thing that might be helpful, other states is, again, very general, just like Indiana, but our military heritage we are actively collecting materials from all over the entire country for any time period, because we're also looking for peacetime service. Um, so we are trying to digitize 
as much as humanly possible and not actually own these records. Um, so families still own these. But we have videos, we have um, photographs, we have letters. So somebody could potentially do an entire project on somebody whose letters are in our collection. Um, one of my favorites is highlighted, George Miller and Mabel Poth. This is a sweet collection from Ohio. It's not even Indiana based, but it's a really sweet um, relationship and they talk about the different things that are going on in their lives. So it's kind of fun in a different way to look at military. So with those free on-site databases, those are what you're going to find here. And then if you Um, I apologize. It seems like we've lost Allison. I don't hear her um, right now. So just we'll pause for a moment and hopefully we can get her back. Hello. Oh. Hello. I think Allison's back. <laughs> Hi. I have no idea. Okay. What Hi. Okay. <laughs> yes. Went away, and I was like, "What just happened?" Oh no. Okay. Hi, guys. <laughs> Here I was. Um. So I was talking about the partnerships between um, Family History Center and Internet Archive. Those are two of our partners. And so when you click on one of the links, these are books from our collection that have been digitized and put online. And so almost 100% of our collection that is outside of copyright has been digitized. And now we're working on orphan works, which are materials that the author is deceased or there is no author and there are no heirs. So orphan works are fun. So these are materials that are online and free for use. Now, I am on the Internet Archive website. And one of the things I wanted to know is you can search within the ACPL collection, but students can search anywhere within the Internet Archive. And we are not the only library that has books and materials that are digitized. So people are able to actually get information from this. Um, Internet Archive is also the, basically they are trying to collect videos, they're trying to collect music, they're trying to collect anything and everything. Um, so they're trying to capture what the world looks like. And they're also the company that has the Wayback Machine. So if somebody's trying to find something like a website that no longer exists, this is how they would be able to find it. So you can see just from this home page that there is a massive library of millions of materials and they are doing some really, really cool work. Um, and you can also watch random TV shows just, just to let you know in case you're curious about what next TV show you should watch. So keep this in mind as you're doing research that there's online resources that are available um, the family history books are also digitized books and by clicking on that link it actually searches all of the books in their collection and they have brand new software that actually searches inside the books for us so you can put in a search term and it'll actually search for it inside the 
and the titles, which is kind of amazing. So we have a lot of information here at the Genealogy Center and within the Lincoln Library that can help researchers. One of the other things I wanted to cover, and this is something that kind of students don't really think about, and I guess sometimes others don't think about it unless you're doing research on a daily basis, um, that you can research with Google. And what people don't think about is the fact that, um, oops, let me go back. I'm going to escape this. There we go. To move things, I apologize. Okay, there we go. So one of the things that you can do is have them go to Google and do a search in quotations. So Jackie Robinson, that's a topic that was suggested today. Now, Jackie Robinson, great topic for breaking barriers. Now, one of the things they might want to look for is primary sources and maybe a collection of some sort. One of the first words that people think of is maybe records. Well, because it's a sport that we're looking at, a person involved in sports, he's going to have records within the sport. So that's not going to be a good search term. So maybe trying a, a different word like manuscripts will bring something up. When we do that, the very first hit is libraryofcongress.gov and it's under collections. So we already have something that could potentially have primary sources available for your students. And here we go. There's a comic book and then they can go through and see what else is available based on this collection. And since it's Library of Congress, pretty helpful because it's for educational purposes. Now, if I go back and scroll down, there's going to be other things that come up. And it's going to be up to the student to figure out whether or not that is something that could be a primary source or secondary source. So kind of looking at clicking on any of these. Okay, if they click on that, is that going to be a primary or secondary? Well, that's going to be a secondary source. And you, they can usually tell by .gov, occasionally .org, um, but the fact that the very first hit is Library of Congress, that should help. Another word is collections. And when we do this, we actually get to the Jackie Robinson archive. So once they see this, they should have pretty much primary source gold for doing their research. And the other part that's really helpful is they have the possibility to actually contact them. Um, so telling them to scroll down to the bottom and look for the contact us, because being able to contact um, organizations that are specific to their topic, they may get a good interview, they may get uh, resources that they hadn't thought of, they may end up with a stack of manuscript papers that they never even thought that they would get their hands on. So it kind of helps to throw these different words in. Um, I usually recommend records, manuscripts, collections. Archives can work too, but sometimes that brings up um, different hits. Let's see if this one will do it for us. So it brings up archives.gov, so it brings up a couple things, and it brings up the Jackie Robinson collection. But then what it starts to do is it goes into um, 
educational websites where it's other people, other students that have done things. Um, so sometimes that's not as helpful, but then again, if you do manuscripts, sometimes it comes up with books by Harper Collins. So they have to learn how to do this with a grain of salt, but a lot of times they'll be able to get the information that they really want and need just by doing this type of search. Quotations are their friends. Um, they can also throw in other terms if they really want to, but it's just a reminder that Google Google really can find things for you. And on that note, I'm actually going to take out archives because one of the things from today that uh, was brought to my attention is that some students still think Wikipedia is a great resource for history. I am in the camp that it is a great resource to find sources, but not a great resource for projects. Now, you guys can argue with me, that's fine. I'm okay with other people having different opinions, but I do like to show them that if they go to the bottom of any article, they can find references, and more importantly, they can find a bibliography and further reading for most historical topics. And a lot of these are really good secondary sources, and occasionally they have a really good primary sources within these articles. So I like Wikipedia to give students a option of where do I even get started with the research? Because by going here, they already have a pretty extensive list of books that they can look at. So I like looking at that. And then let me go back here. Yay. All right. They can also add uh, locations. They can add dates. But the biggest thing is, is contacting. Um, they want to contact the archive library or organization that holds them if they're not digitized. Now, contacting archivists and librarians. Students need to try it first. Because honestly, again, we have a soft spot in our heart for younger people. Even the most crotchety librarian or archivist usually is happy when a student calls and asks an honest question about what they want to look for um, and isn't trying to, I don't know, print call us because that actually still happens. Um, they need to use the information that they found online to cite what they're actually talking about. Um, they can contact local. So if a student is doing a research project on, uh, I don't know, the Boston massacre, they need to contact the archivists and library, libraries in Boston and that would potentially help them. Honey catches more flies than vinegar. I like that saying, I use it quite a bit, and I use it with genealogists, family history, historians, historians in general, anybody who is looking for more information and wants help from somebody, the sweeter, nicer you are, the more information you're gonna get. And calling is always the best. People can ignore emails, put it off to the next day or the next week. I'm sure we all have had times where we've been busy and haven't been able to answer that email right away. Well, libraries and archives and organizations get busy too. So if you call and catch somebody, you're more likely to get a response right away, even while they're on the phone. So having students do that really helps. And again, because it's a student, we're more likely to help. I know that sounds terrible, but not going to lie. <laughs> so some absolutely wonderful primary sources beyond that newspapers.com. I wanted to give you some other newspapers that could be helpful. 
And so these are a list of different websites that can help. So we have Chronically in America. This is done by the Library of Congress. They have newspapers from all over the country that have been digitized. And what a lot of these are in Chronically in America are newspapers that have been digitized through the local historical societies or um, state libraries or whatever you may have. That's where they're getting this information a lot of times. Now, what they're gonna wanna do is search here I don't know what Seymour's in there for, but we're gonna go with it. You can change the dates. You can also change the states, but we're just gonna go with this because I don't know what we're gonna get. Um, so then we actually have hits. Oh, hey yo, this looks like fun. Announcing a sequel to the flapper wife, Mae Seymour. I like her. I don't know who she is. 1925, New Britain, Connecticut. So this could be something that's beneficial. Again, once I go back, you'll be able to see. I'll go back again. Um, 1963 is the end date for here. So this is not going to be as helpful for more recent history. And quite honestly, this is really helpful for colonial um, time period. Um, even going into Civil War and some Victorian era stuff. But beyond that, it gets a little hit or miss. It is a good website and I do recommend it. Google News. So Google News actually has been digitizing newspapers from all over. And they're in alphabetical order. People can look and see if the one they're looking for is in here, or they can just search for a topic within this. But these have been digitized and been put online. So searching this is separate from searching Google. But you can find a lot of really cool newspapers from some different time periods. So like this one is a month in 2007. I don't know why that would be helpful, but hey, if it is, cool. Whereas this one is, what, 20 years, so 1920s to 1940s. So that could be helpful. It really depends on what the student's topic is. All right. I know I said I didn't like Wikipedia, but we're going to Wikipedia. Why? Because some kind soul has put together a list in here of digitized newspapers and they tell you whether or not they're online and free and whether it's just an index only or if it's a transcription and it goes by state. Now they also have other countries which is incredibly helpful if somebody has a research project that is going into another country. I just really hope that they can speak the language. We went over that several times today. Unfortunately, the students didn't know that Berlin is in Germany, and that made my heart sad. I really hope everybody else does. So as I'm flying through this, you can see there's so many options. And it's free. And the reason that you want to use this list is who would know that the Belmar Historical Society has an online collection of newspapers for that location? Um, it's kind of obscure, so that's why that list is incredibly helpful. Elefind is kind of neat because it searches newspaper databases um, and has a list of titles. Let's go there. Um, so you can actually see what they have as well. And it tells you what their um, sources are. So they are searching the National Library of Australia and all of their digital assets. They are searching the Colorado Historic Newspapers Collection. So they're searching different collections in one search, which is helpful, but it's 
not everything. None of these websites are. This list that I'm giving you is what I typically give people after they have um, already searched the paid websites and can't find anything. Um, then we look at this. So then there's also the ancestor hunt. So again, this is a genealogy website, except for the fact that they give you newspaper links. And it goes through and it gives you a summary for each of the states and then some of the special US collections and then some in the other locations. So for example, if I click on Indiana, what it's gonna do is it's actually going to tell you what the free newspapers are and where they're housed. So all those websites I gave you, this kind of puts them in one place as well. I don't know which resource is actually gonna be the most helpful for your students. I think that's up to you and how they research. Um, but I wanted to make sure that you knew that these all exist and that you can use them, all of these for free from home without having any subscriptions whatsoever. Okay, um, so I'm gonna talk about some other um, primary sources that can be accessed online uh, that I have found pretty useful in the past. So one was, I'm just kind of starting broad and, and getting narrower, but one of them was uh, the National Archives, which Allison had touched on and went to when um, she was researching Jackie Robinson online. Uh, so this is just uh, this would be very useful, I think, for anyone doing research that's not Indiana-based or even that is Indiana-based. Um, and since we've visited that website already, I won't go to that one. Um, but then the rest of these resources that I have are more Indiana-based. And so we'll go to um, Indiana Memory, which is really neat. This is a... Um, kind of a, a, a collective. So it's has it's made up of multiple contributors, um, different repositories within Indiana. Um, and so this, let's see, you can go to different collections. And so these might be in different repositories um, across the state and it'll provide links to them. And so this website actually even has uh, resources from repositories that I had listed um, uh, over here. So like um, University Library Digital Collections, uh, some of those sources, if they have been digitized, will be available on Indiana Memory. Um, so just to kind of get an idea of what's on here, um, we'll look up Madam C.J. Walker, who I'm sure is going to be a pretty popular topic this year for breaking barriers. Um, but as you can see, so it shows um, the item, which a lot of these are gonna be images. Some of these are scanned documents, um, but it'll give a description of what it is. And then it'll say the uh, collection that it came from. Um, so we'll click on, let's see, we'll click on this image here. So if you scroll down here, this one is actually, um, this is from the Indiana Historical Society. And what's really nice is the links that it provides here. So it gives you its own description on the page, um, but you can also click on this link here and it will take you to the original source. So this is something that's in our digital collections at the Indiana Historical Society. Um, so it's just, kind of it's a nice catch-all um, if an organization is in partnership with this um, then it'll it'll show up on here as well as their own website and so here's just a little about um, section that tells you more about Indiana memory so I think that's a really good um, website to recommend to students who are doing an Indiana-based topic um, and it it's 
I don't know if this would be more overwhelming or less overwhelming than searching those repositories individually. Um, but it is, it's, it's nice that it will, it'll kind of, it'll cover multiple bases. Um, so this one would be University of Indianapolis, the digital mayoral archives. This one is going to be um, useful only to someone who's researching Indianapolis. But this is probably one of my favorite digital resources um, that I've come across. I utilize this a lot doing my thesis research. Um, Let's see, but this is, yeah, this is out of University of Indianapolis. And so you'll just scroll down to browse the mayoral archives. Um, so let's see, you can go to general search. I like advanced search um, again, because so a lot of these, when you search digitally, it'll look within all of these collections. So these are different collections that are in the mayoral archives. Um, and with the exception of uh, Bulin, these are um, three of the more prominent mayors, um, past mayors of Indianapolis. Um, and so when you search here, it'll be searching all of these collections. So it, it'll give you a lot. And since a lot of these are, um, you know, political and mayoral documents, they can be kind of confusing. So it's nice to be able to narrow it down. So um, we'll do, let's see, we'll type in UNIGOV just into the subject section there. Um, and so UNIGOV was passed in 1970 in Indianapolis. So we'll start with 1969 and then just go to 1970. And this, um, this repository has a lot of Im images, but it's definitely more manuscript heavy. Um, and this is great because you'll get a lot of um, documents from meetings or documents um, that a lot of correspondence, things that had been written to a mayor or written by a mayor. Um, so this is, if you're doing something Indianapolis specific, this is a really, um, a really great resource for that. If it has anything to do with maybe civics, um, something political. And I think too, in our National History Day guide, we actually, we have some um, special prize topics where this would be a really good um, resource if someone were doing a project on one of those. I think UNIGOV is a suggestion. Um, Julia Carson, I'm sure there might be some things on Julia Carson in this um, on this website, but that's one of my um, favorite sort of Indianapolis based uh, digital repositories. So Ball State University um, has been doing a lot of digitizing lately. And what's neat about um, Ball State's digital repository is they have a lot of um, moving pictures on here. So they have videos. Um, I personally have not um, perused this uh, collection too much. I've used it from time to time, um, but it's, going to have um, more materials that might be related to Ball State itself or the Muncie area. Um, and again, like, so this IUPUI digital collections, this is something else that can be found or will could be linked to when using Indiana memory. Um, and so this is, um, a lot of this stuff is going to be Indianapolis as well in um, at IUPUI, but there are some broader Indiana-based um, collections on here, but they're broken up pretty nicely. So let's see, we'll go to Allison Transmission. Um, so some of their stuff is, let's see. So yeah, it'll. I think it'll list collections that aren't digitized as well, but we'll click on one that's available online. Um, and so the format looks pretty similar um, 
to some of these other things if you're looking at digital collections uh, for the historical society. Um, but it'll have, depending upon the collection, there's a nice variety. So it'll have, you know, maybe news clippings, images, manuscript materials. Um, so a nice selection of, of digitized materials there. Um, and I believe that is all I have. But again, Indiana Memory is a nice, you know, sort of catch all looking for um, Indiana sources and it'll take you to links to those different repositories. So that's something that I really like about Indiana Memory. Um, and again, I would highly recommend the digital mayoral archives if someone is doing a project based in Indianapolis, something sort of civic based, just because it's it's a gold mine as far as um, primary sources dealing with politics in Indianapolis. And so. I will hand it back over to Allison. Thank you. I enjoyed that last example with Allison Transmission. And I was a little <laughs> like, it was named after me because, you know, when you're a little, you think everything's about you. How wrong I was. Anyway, um, so one of the things to probably discuss with students, and it was kind of interesting, again, um, working with the students today, they really didn't know what an annotated bibliography was. So talking about credit versus citation in projects, that was interesting as well. So I guess it's not something that's always taught. I, I don't know. I think it really depends on the school and the teacher. And, you know, maybe the students just forget because, again, they didn't know Berlin was in Germany. I, I don't know. That, that rocked my world, especially since I found out one of the students was born in Germany. So let's just discuss that. Anyway, so credit, you know, it just gives the credit to the creator for free use of their material. So they can give credit in the project, but they have to cite the sources in the bibliography. Um, so one of the biggest things is to um, be careful of plagiarizing. And I think that's going to be one of the biggest issues for students because the, what they'll do is they'll put in um, an image into onto an exhibit and they won't put where it came from. And that's going to be the biggest hit that most students get when they are being judged. Um, and, you know, with each competition, the further they get, the harsher they're going to be judged. So the first time it's not going to be as big of a deal, but if they don't make the changes before the next competition, if they're moved on, then it's going to probably be a little bit harsher. Um, the citation, it, it's a must in proper research. They, they must name all the sources for the material. And that's everything. That's the images, the videos, the text, the quotes, the interviews. Um, and, you know, a lot of students don't think about the images having to be cited. Don't think about a quote having to be cited. Well, where did you get it? So that's something that is a little bit hard for them to get, but so vitally important to this project. And quite honestly, um, if they're going to be moving on to a college career, this is setting them up for um, doing really well in their classes, being able to actually cite and credit sources pretty quickly. So fun fact, I use Pixabay for all of my stuff. If you are not familiar with Pixabay, I highly recommend it. Um, I'm going to show you guys really quick just so So Pixabay are free images that you can use anywhere. So the credit for the images within the PowerPoint that have not been um, in-house images have all been from Pixabay because there are really cool images you can, um, if it's not something that is necessary like they just need a picture of a book. 
they can search for a book and they can find, okay, so this could be the top of their website if they're doing something on, I don't know, old books. Who knows what the topic is, but these could be images that they could use and they're free and able to use. So fun way to actually talk about citations is being able to go to the citations for um, this PowerPoint. So yeah, these books came from it. There are some resources to help with citing and keeping track of sources. Um, so from the guide, it says required to use Turabian or MLA, um, your choice, but the students must be consistent. So there are some free citation managers, um, Zotero and Mendeley. I don't know how to say that, not gonna lie. I also have a lot of garbage up here. As a researcher, this doesn't not normally bother me, but you guys may be a little bothered. Okay, so I can't download it to this computer because um, I am actually on a work computer right now and we're not allowed to download things. So just to show you, it is basically a research assistant. It's free, um, it puts the citations in, it keeps track of them for the students. Um, it's really easy to organize. I have played in this on my personal computer, but this is not something I have on this one. So I do recommend this as a possibility for your students. Uh, another one is that Mendeley. This one I have not used, but I've heard good things about it. Now this one, um, you can access the information anywhere. It's reference tool. Eventually it does, you can download it for free and then um, it's a paid one after so many citations. But quite honestly, that makes sense. Um, and then what's nice about this is get it on a phone. I mean, students typically have their phones on them um, even when they're not supposed to. So you can go ahead and have them download it and then that's how they can keep track of their citations and all of the information that they need. Um, citation help, citation machine, this has been around for ages. I used it in college and that's been a hot minute. So they're really easy. You can put in a book. Um, I have no idea what these are. <laughs> I know what that search is. Uh, oh, the gastronomical me, that's a book. We will go and find that book. All right, if I select it, it's actually gonna give me the information, final step. I really hope all of you have used this before. Um, so what's interesting is the person who put the information in here is wrong with some of it. So the author is MFK Fisher. And I know, I know this because I've actually held the book. So those were people that had um, a foreword in it, so I wouldn't use that in the citation. But these are easy, easy to copy, easy to edit. These are, this is the fun part. This company is owned by them. This company is owned by the same people. This company is owned by the same people. <laughs> and this company is different. <laughs> um, so the reason I give you all three of these is they are slightly different. It's a slightly different style. So it is something that they can use um, that could be helpful. Um, but again, it's owned by the same company, so it's not gonna to be too much of a variation. And then there's this little guy. So you could do a generator here and add the information, pick a newspaper article, encyclopedia entry, whatever they feel like. And it goes through from there and puts that information together for them. Um, so while they could get a bibliography put together for them, and that's excellent, they still have to annotate it themselves. So they'll have fun. 
that, that's going to be an exciting adventure and learning. We all like learning. So anyway, that's the end of the official presentation. Um, are there any questions? Can we like unmute them? Um. Oh, unmute all. Okay. Did that work? No. Let's see. I don't have control. <laughs> um. Trying to click it too, but I don't. Um. Okay, so we might not be able to unmute you, but if you have any questions, um, you can type them up in that um, question section. You can unmute ourselves. Oh, I heard somebody. Hi. Yeah. If you can unmute yourself, go for it. Okay, there we go. We have someone, I think. I'm going to quit messing with it and let you do this. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I believe I unmuted Karen. Um, but I don't know that I can hear anything. Yeah, so just to be safe, since it seems like it's not working, if you do have any questions, um, I think we'll just do those in that question, in the uh, typed, in the typed questions. Okay, it does look like a couple people. Oh, a couple people are unmuted. Hi. All right, Constance is unmuted, Karen's unmuted. This is Karen, can you hear me? Hi, I, I, very <laughs> quiet, but. I don't know what I'm hearing now. Yeah, I think the issue is going to be that unless they have um, like a microphone of some sort, uh, we might not be able to to hear. Yeah. Well, let's click on the next slide because this is the important information. Yes. Yeah. So this is the information that you guys need. Um, names email addresses, phone numbers. So if you have specific questions for either one of us, please, please, please reach out. And also too, something that I, um, I forgot to mention earlier when I was talking about IHS resources, um, and Allison discussed this uh, a lot more in depth in regards to Allen County Public Library, but our archivists are more than willing to help out anyone with questions as well. So there is contact information on their website. Um, also too, uh, if you can't find it or you would prefer to just go ahead and contact me first, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I'd be happy to pass along any reference questions as well. Um, but yeah, I think that is all I have. 
Okay, and if anybody wants a list of um, all of the resources covered, if that would be easier, um, I know you may have been taking notes or grading papers, depending on your life. Um, happy to send those to you, so please let us know. Yeah, okay, so on that note, um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the viewing and yeah if you guys have any questions just feel free to contact us with that contact information down there thank you guys